Good morning, everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Mark Britton, and I'm the marketing manager for the Syngenta Potato Portfolio. So I'm sure most of you are aware by now that during the course of this week, Syngenta has been running a series of virtual potato science live meetings, uh, which I've been chairing each day. Today's topic is biostimulants, and the uh, Syngenta presenter for today is, is Michael Tate. Um, probably useful just to give you a recap of the other topics that we've been running this week and what's planned for tomorrow. So on Monday, we had a session on seed and soil bond pathogens. On Tuesday, we covered soil pest management. Uh, yesterday, we looked at blight management. And all of those sessions and today's sessions you can find on the Syngenta UK TV YouTube channel. Um, so they're there as recordings for you to go and visit if you're unable to attend or if you want to look at something uh, just to, to review it again. Uh, tomorrow's session is on sustainability. So if you haven't registered yet and you're interested in that event, there is still time to sign up. So if you visit the events page of the Syngenta UK uh, website, you'll be able to register for, for tomorrow's event. So before I hand over to Michael, I've just got a, a slide on housekeeping that I'd like to run through. So Syngenta, as we're the host, we're going to record the webinar, as I mentioned, uh, via Zoom, and the recording will be published on the Syngenta UK uh, TV YouTube channel, and that'll be after the event, and no recording by anyone else or by any other means is permitted. Uh, if you have any questions, and please submit them via the, the Q&A function, uh, so don't use chat, you know, it's a Q&A function at, at the bottom, and that's where we'll be taking and answering questions, and that'll be at the end of Michael's session. And um, we're also going to send you an email tomorrow, and that'll have information on how to apply for basis and then Roso points, and also include a link to a, a feedback survey. So with that, I will now head over to, to Michael to cover the uh, biostimulant session today. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, let me just uh, find my slides. Is that coming through okay, Mark? It's always hard to tell from this. Uh, it's not in presentation mode at the moment. Can okay, I press the button? How's that? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to um, the event today. My name's Michael Tate. I'm the technical manager looking after uh, potato products and also veg products. And I'm going to talk to you today about sort of a new uh, area for us, really. Um, You'll know that we're well associated in the past with um, crop protection products and also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, with um, seeds and varieties. But we're now getting to become involved in um, looking at biostimulants and the role that these may play within um, crop protection and crop production in the future. So, uh, I'll do this as a bit of a story. Um, we started out on this sort of journey um, in 2017. And when we received this material from our colleagues in Argentina uh, under the name of uh, Qantas, we didn't really know very much about it, to be honest, because as far as we could see at the time, no one had done uh, previous studies in the potato crop. There had been work done in soya, cotton and maize, I think it was. And um, so we, we started out at quite a low base of knowledge and we turned to work with CMI, who at that time uh, were run by Dr. Chris Green and they had some previous experience in looking at various biostimulant type materials. So in the first year, let me just see if I can find my pointer here. So in the first year, we had a very simple protocol where we looked at applying at three different growth stages and we used at each stage uh, two litres per hectare. And when the um, data was analysed during the latter part of the season, um, CMI came back and showed us some of these results. And I think, although there was nothing particularly spectacular, it nevertheless was interesting because we could see that um, the rate of bulking appeared to be slightly better with Qantas than with the untreated. Um, we had a slightly longer duration of um, bulking. And also we noticed when um, the data was analyzed that um, the proportion of tubers in the sort of 55, 75 um, area was, um, was greater having used Qantas. So we thought, well, at least it's worth having another go and doing a slightly more comprehensive type of experiment. 
So in the following year, um, we went with a, a, a much broader treatment list. And this is set out here. We looked at um, applying at um, emergence, onset of bulking, onset of bulking plus two weeks, canopy max, and then double application. So all of these, sorry, all of these here would be single applications. This is a double application where we combine those two. And this one here is where we combine the slightly later um, treatments. And then at the bottom, we've got the kind of bells and whistles approach where all four applications went on. And what was quite clear in this year, um, 2018, was we got quite a good yield response um, from the treatments uh, compared to the untreated. And for those of you who sort of cast your minds back, um, 2018 was a jolly uh, hot and really quite a stressful season um, for the development of the potato crop. Now in doing this process, CMI looked at doing some um, estimates of bulking with the different materials and what they thought would happen uh, with expected bulking rates. And one of the things that we noticed in this experiment was that following this sort of heat period, there were two very distinct phases of tuber bulking. Crop here was um, Russet Burbank. And that was that um, in, the, in the second phase here, um, the, there were big differences. So if you look at phase one, you can see that the rate of bulking, really no real effect of the treatments. In the phase two, um, after the sort of main heat stress period, you'll see that there are differences in the rate of bulking. And one of the things that was of interest to us was that the, <clears throat> the use of Qantas um, was uh, allowing the rate of bulking to continue at a higher rate than uh, with the untreated. So that created a great deal of interest in the business. Um, clearly, uh, the product had efficacy in the potato crop. It was now really a matter of trying to um, show that again and also to see what other parameters might be important. So in 2019, we repeated the trial, not exactly the same treatment list, but a very similar treatment list. So we had emergence, onset of bulking, onset of bulking plus two weeks. Uh, those were the single treatments. Then we had some double treatments uh, using various combinations. And finally, we had a three program treatment here. So we didn't go for the four program one that we had in the previous year. And once again, in 2019, we were able to show um, some tuber yield differences between the untreated and the various treatments that we employed. And there were also differences in the mean tuber fresh weight, uh, which um, again indicated that the product was having an effect. Over the three years of work with CMI, I mentioned earlier that we saw some uh, impact on tuber size distribution. And this is just a little summary uh, of what was seen in each of those three seasons. And as you can see that generally, we were seeing with the dark line here, uh, a difference. Um, and not always statistically significant, but though it seemed to be a fairly consistent difference in these three small scale trials. So probably at this stage, it's worth saying a little bit about um, the composition and what we knew at the time um, about Qantas uh, and the information that we were working on as a bit of additional background before I talk about the 2020 trial season and the work we did in the big um, farm trial in 2020. So Qantas comes about as a result of a byproduct from um, production of sugar from sugarcane. Uh, it comes to us from a company in Argentina. And as I mentioned previously, it's been quite widely used in South America and a few other places as well um, as a biostimulant in a number of different crops. In terms of composition, you've got organic carbon, you've got amino acids, potassium and uh, calcium. Generally, um, the, the way that it's been um, sold and positioned within the market has been that it helps to alleviate heat stress. This may well be connected with drought in, in addition, but the link to heat stress seems the clearest um, empirical link in how the product is actually working. So it's about mitigating um, abiotic stress in the crop. And in this particular case, um, we're looking at heat. There are of course many other abiotic stresses that the crop can suffer from. 
So in terms of um, the information that we currently have about the mode of action, and I would stress that that information primarily comes from other crops. As I'll tell you a bit later in the talk, we are looking at doing much more detailed work in the potato crop in this coming season. So the main way that it's working is that when the crop is um, um, when the crop's under stress, the best thing to do is to try to apply the Qantas before that stress, particularly that heat stress occurs. Um, it has an ability to, um, to activate some of the sort of cellular machinery uh, and help with the way the genes are doing and to affect um, calcium ion signaling within the plant. And one of the key things seems to be its ability as an antioxidant, it helps to minimize um, the effect of reactive oxygen species, particularly within the foliage, which can cause quite a lot of damage um, if the plant's leaves get too hot. The other thing that appears to be going on is helping with osmosis and osmotic pressure, uh, maintaining turgor within the cells so the plant is able to function uh, better under that heat stress. And overall, these sort of combined activities are, are helping to maintain or deliver slightly higher yield under the heat stress that it finds itself under. We didn't have, as I said at the beginning, we didn't really have a clear picture of how this product was working in the potato crop. We've come up with a general hypothesis, and this is going to be tested um, uh, in much more detail uh, with the work we're planning to do with the University of Nottingham uh, during this year, and, and that work is just starting to get underway. So we currently, the hypothesis is that under optimal sort of conditions, foliage is growing well, uh, and it's able to, um, uh, cytokinins are helping with cell division with the developing tubers, and it draws assimilates down into the tubers, and you get your bulking. In the, the very high heat conditions, oxidative stress starts to occur in the leaves. Um, this produces certain enzymes and breakdown products, and basically, the plant then is, is less able to put assimilates down and may well be drawing assimilates from um, the tubers in order to protect its foliage. And we think this is probably illustrated by the information that we had from CMI back in 2018, which showed those very different rates of bulking um, after heat stress. So again, this is um, how we think it's working, but I would emphasize this is a hypothesis and we are working to try to get greater clarity on this going forward. So we came to the 2020 season. Uh, we had a few trials which indicated interesting uh, activity and some um, statistical differences from using Qantas in potatoes. Um, but we wanted to try to push forward very quickly with the development. Um, as I'm sure most of you will be aware, products which are biostimulants do not have to go through CRD. So that route of um, getting a product into a market is slightly less complicated for um, biostimulants than it would be for standard crop protection materials. But these are not materials that we as Syngenta are particularly used to working with. Our, you know, kind of our heritage has very much been with crop protection products where often um, answers on efficacy are very clear. They're very black and white. You either control weeds or you don't. Uh, whereas a, with biostimulants, you're looking at much more subtle effects on the plant and also potentially with a lot more interaction with the actual environmental conditions. And we felt uh, rather than doing um, small scale trials again, as we had done with CMI, that we would try a different approach. And that approach would be um, to look at a lot of split fields on farm because one of the advantages of biostimulants is they're not subject to the crop destruction rules that you would have with a standard CP product. So we decided um, at the beginning of the season that um, we wanted multiple farm sites with split fields. Uh, and in order to deliver this, we needed to cooperate uh, very closely with ADAS because they have staff spread in different parts of the country. They additionally have expertise through the YEN project in doing cross field analysis, which we don't have very much experience in. They had access to some satellite monitoring. And as I mentioned earlier on, they had people on the ground who could go out and dig up um, the tubers when we came to harvest. 
We also um, worked in collaboration with the Association of Independent Potato Consultants because of their specific expertise in potatoes and also uh, so that they would get a sight of this material um, within their own fields and their own farms. And the idea here was that they would um, independently do their work, but uh, send the results back to ADAS for that final uh, cross-site, multi-site uh, field analysis at the end of the season. And although um, CMI, following the death of uh, Dr. Chris Green, uh, was wound up, it reformed to an extent as green crop information um, as part of beeswax farming. And because of their history with the product, we also had some sites with them. Of course, as soon as you go out on farm, there then become a lot of very important practical considerations. And one of these is how does the product flow? Does it cause any problems in um, sprayers or anything like that? So we had to do some tests uh, to check that it would flow through the type of sprayers we use and also to check that um, physical, it was physically compatible uh, with all of the key blight fungicides because we did assume that um, the main timing that people would put the product on would coincide with the application of a blight fungicide. So quite a lot of work went on with that early in the year, which for those of you who cast your minds back to um, March last year was quite challenging because it was the beginning of the COVID crisis. So getting physical compatibility work done um, was, was quite tricky, but we did manage to achieve that in time for the start of the potato season. So we work with ADAS, with our own staff and uh, distributor staff and various other experts to establish uh, sites. We tried wherever possible to look at sites, to assess them, to try to ensure they were as even and fair as possible. Uh, and we made a simple protocol looking at three application timings, which are pretty similar to the ones that we'd used in the uh, previous work with CMI. So this was the sort of thing we did. We got a lot of the sites that ADAS helped us with. They looked at the fields, they took photographs, they assessed whether they had some chance of being sufficiently even. And then um, fields were given a map so that the growers could see where to apply Qantas, uh, where to leave untreated. And most importantly, we had these paired sampling areas uh, um, along the field so that when we came to harvest, uh, we had sections of field that we could lift uh, and assess and these would be uh, paired samples that would help when it came to the final analysis cross-site analysis of all of the data this just gives you an idea of the type of the first application timing and this map shows you where um, the sites were and you can see there's quite a good scatter of sites clearly a lot of them on the east coast some in the west part of the country and a few up into Scotland and the borders. And as I mentioned, we had um, you know, a number of people help us to set up all of these, these different sites uh, across the country. Um, we did try to take some pictures during the season, but with the um, lockdown situation that we found ourselves in, we didn't get as many um, photographs of sites as I should have liked. But generally speaking, um, field observation didn't show many um, foliage differences. To be honest, from the previous work with CMI, we were not expecting to see a lot of foliar differences um, and we didn't see a consistent pattern of foliage differences between treated and untreated. One of the things that was a huge surprise um, to me when I tried to organize the trial in the first place was just the number of different varieties um, that were used in the trial. That was not, not something that I had expected when we started out. Uh, I guess with the benefit of hindsight, I might have tried to restrict the number of varieties a bit because you can see from this graph, one of the immediate problems is that um, many varieties only appeared once. So making any sort of comparison of um, the product on the variety in different situations was very difficult. There were a few varieties where there were multiple inclusions, but not many. So I think um, that was a kind of a learning thing uh, after the event that we, we, if we were to ever to do it again, I would look at trying to have a more compact number of varieties. So it would be easier to see how variety compared in different circumstances. This little chart just gives you an idea again of some of the variability that 
uh, we saw in the trial, so quite a wide planting window, a windows for the applications and then the harvesting or uh, data collection window for the tubers. All of the sites that ADAS helped us to manage um, were harvested and those tubers were sent to ADAS Rosemond uh, because ADAS Rosemond had a grader so that we could carry out grading work. Uh, each individual member of the AIPC uh, did their own grading work um, but they sent the data, as I mentioned earlier, to ADAS, and the same was true of green crop information. We have some results from other European countries, but I'm not specifically going to cover those uh, today. But the project is not just confined to uh, the UK. So the other thing which uh, became very important um, based on what we believed and understood about the way the product works is understanding uh, where we were having heat stress events. So there was a big exercise to gather weather data from uh, Meteo Blue, our weather station system um, that we, we, we buy into. And we wanted to identify uh, where we were seeing foliar temperatures of 25 degrees or more for at least four hours per day, or those sites where we saw very high um, foliar temperatures of 30 degrees and above pretty much at any sort of time of the day. Now this um, quite busy Excel chart tries to give you an idea of how we went about trying to um, understand what was happening at the different sites. And I'll just give you one example for us to start off with. So here we've got the variety Maribel, one of the ADAS sites. And what we've done is tried to do is to uh, calculate the total number of extreme heat events at 30 or uh, where we've had 25 centigrade or more for greater than four hours through um, from sort of the first application through to the last application, which would have been before the end of August. So we got a total number of heat events. We've looked here at the uh, untreated yield, the Qantas yield, and you can see there that in this case, we've got quite a big um, difference. But you can see also that there is a big range and I haven't shown you the bottom part of the graph or bottom part of this chart where we've got some where we've got a negative uh, effect of the product on yield. But this was the sort of the range of data that we had and interpreting this, um, we kind of, we, that's why we'd involved ADAS. We gave them all of this data. They had all the yield data, which I've already mentioned. And then it was a matter of looking for the correlation between um, the temperatures and um, the effects on yield. So this was the first graph that um, ADAS provided. Uh, and what you'll notice is you've got these very big error bars. You'll see that um, in a number of sites, we've got an improvement in yield. And in some sites, uh, we've got an apparent yield depression. But you need to be careful because you can see on here, these error bars are generally very, very big. Uh, when um, ADAS analyze this data, what they do is they look at uh, the range and they make, and they do what's called weighting of the data. And that means that where you've got small error bars in the final analysis, sites that have small error bars count more in the analysis than a site where you've got really huge error bars, because obviously there is something going on in there, which is probably not directly affected to um, the products. Whereas here where you've got smaller error bars, you, you're more confident that you're getting a real result. And at the initial uh, assessment, we were getting across all of the sites, regardless of any things to do with temperature or anything like that, we were getting a small benefit of 0.94 of a ton. Not a great deal. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. They also looked um, at um, analysis of the tube grading. And here, unfortunately, we didn't see a repetition in the, all of the sites that ADAS had of the information that we had from CMI in the previous years. And I suspect that one of the reasons we didn't get that goes back to the sheer number of different varieties that we had um, on farm. And I think if we had in advance had a more controlled number of varieties, I think our results might have been closer to the ones that we had previously seen from, from CMI. Uh, and interestingly, uh, when the AIPC data was analyzed again, you saw much the same sort of thing. But within the AIPC trials, there was also a big range of varieties. 
you'll see that they use slightly different grading systems um, because basically these were done more manually uh, and these are done more by machine. When we got um, grading data from uh, green crop information, they did think in the uh, four sites that they had, that they had some effect from Qantas in three of the uh, four sites they had, but in one of their sites, they, they had no effect. So in three of their sites, they were seeing something akin to the pattern that they'd seen in their small scale trials in the past. But the really important bit of data from our perspective comes from uh, looking here at the effect on heat stress, of heat stress. And here, the first thing to notice is we're looking at at least 14 days of heat stress from the first application through to the end of August. And we're looking at leaf temperatures of 25 or more for at least four hours. And here we were getting statistically significant differences showing that under these conditions, uh, Qantas was able to significantly outyield the untreated. And that's in these bars here. And this is based on 32 sites. So it's combined ADAS and uh, AIPC and other data to give this result. In addition, uh, we had an assessment of extreme temperatures. Here we only had um, 14 sites. And although these um, data sets are close to being statistically different, they're not quite. But I think if we'd had perhaps a few more sites um, at that level, we would have seen a significant difference there as well. So I think at the end of the day, uh, we had um, a positive effect on yield um, where we had heat uh, and the crap was based on 32 sites and a very nearly positive effect um, in uh, where you've got more than 30 degrees, but that wasn't statistically significant, whereas the one at 25 degrees with a greater number of sites was. So I think we have developed a pretty clear picture, pretty clear understanding of where the product will work. Um, we've had to deal with, as you'll have seen, quite a lot of variation uh, in terms of the, the soils, the varieties, the times of planting. Uh, we've also had irrigated compared to unirrigated crops, and we looked carefully to see if we could see a clear association with the use of the product and irrigation, but we, we couldn't see that. Another thing that we looked at in some detail was whether or not um, the determinacy level of the potato variety had an effect. Again, we couldn't show a clear effect from that. So the heat effect is by far the clearest information from our, our studies so far. Since then, uh, we've started looking at um, the United Kingdom and looking at different areas and trying to find out where and how often heat um, of the type that we're talking about is likely to occur. So we've done a bit of an analysis based on weather data for the period um, April through to September for these four seasons. And we've defined a heat event as where you're getting the more than four hours at this 25 degrees centigrade. And that's using uh, weather hub data that we have access to. I'm just gonna give you a snapshot of that at the moment because this is really work that's ongoing. And uh, we're gonna do more on this as we come into this coming season. So if you look, um, just a snapshot here of four different locations, uh, Ross on Wye, Southwell in Knotts, March in Cambridge and Swaffham in Norfolk. These are the years that we've looked at. And these are the number of those heat stress events that we've seen in different years in these different locations. So in some, you know, there is, as you can see, quite a lot of variability in how often you get the heat stress events. What I think is very noticeable here is that 2018, when we had those very clear results from CMI, um, you know, it was clearly a year when there was a lot of, um, con a lot of days or a lot of occasions uh, when we reached that threshold of more than 25 um, centigrade. Um, so that's quite interesting and that's work that we're continuing to sort of follow up on. And just to end up, I'll say a little bit about what we are planning to do. I mentioned earlier that we are working with um, University of Nottingham to try and delve in to much more detail about how uh, Qantas exerts its effect in the potato crop, because so far our knowledge in this area is rather generalized. So they're looking at, um, or will be looking at, I should say, heat stress in the lab uh, and under reduced water conditions. They're going to look with some new machinery um, 
at, in some detail of what happens in foliage to see what we can pick up because with things like NDVI we haven't really picked up anything but I think by looking in some more detail uh, we'll, we'll be hopefully pick up more clues as to what's happening with photosynthesis uh, and fluorescence. When we'll be do, doing some genetic studies in a, a model plant, Aridopsis, to try and understand the mechanisms by which the Qantas product is exerting effect, probably in terms of affecting um, certain genes, upregulating or downregulating them, and that probably is affecting the hormonal distribution within the plant. So I think we're hoping that um, this year will enable us to come to a much clearer idea of how Qantas works, um, as opposed to the rather more hypothetical and general ideas that we currently, currently work under. And finally, we will be doing some field trials this year. We have, we're not planning to do um, the kind of large scale split fields that we did last year. Our approach will be very much more to try to understand uh, whether timing application um, as a growth stage is the best approach or whether we should be using um, digital technology to predict when heat stress will occur and try to then apply ahead of that heat stress or whether or not um, we can get away with applying after a heat stress event because obviously from a grower's point of view it's probably easier to do a reactive approach rather than a, um, a predictive approach but we'll try and test out which of these appears to be uh, the, the best and most effective way to deploy the product. We would uh, be interested in doing a small number of split field trials, particularly if anybody has um, the capability to do yield monitoring, because I think one of the, um, the weaknesses in what we did in 2020 was um, small plot digging up, digging up three meters of row or pairs of three meters of row across the field we ended up with more variability than would have been ideal, simply because of the nature of the potato crop. You know, when you're digging up three meters a row and you get to the end of that three meters, are you digging up that plant or do you pull away from that plant? So you could get quite a lot of variability in um, the yield within that plot area. So again, if we can do it on a bigger scale, uh, which doesn't require people actually digging stuff with a fork, I think that would be, be useful to try. So that brings it to a conclusion. Thank you very much. Um, I hope it was interesting and you can see the kind of direction that we are, we are trying to go in uh, with this product. Um, any questions really? Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, we have a, a few questions that have come in already. Um, I think from my point of view, it's good to see, I guess the, the amounts of work that you've put into developing this product. I think the feedback I have generally around biostimulants is that people are looking for more technical credibility and rigor behind the claims that are made. So it's good to see the work that you've put into this already and that you're looking to develop further in 2021 and beyond. Um, so we have a few questions. Uh, just a reminder, if anybody does want to submit questions, please submit them via the, the Q&A function. Uh, we've got two or three at the moment, so we could have some more. So the first question, uh, did any varieties stand out to be more responsive to Qantas? Um, to be honest, no, we couldn't see that because, as I say, I mentioned earlier that um, most of the varieties we had single or maybe a couple of um, occurrences on, on the field. So we couldn't reliably say whether one variety was more, more responsive than others. If you ask me whether I suspect that is the case, then I, I think it probably is. Um, but at the moment, we don't have a way of determining um, which variety would be the most responsive. I thought possibly there was a link to determinacy, and we looked, um, we tried to sort of categorize all the varieties that we had according to the, you know, kind of accepted view on its determinacy. Um, but we couldn't see a clear link between, you know, response and use of Qantas in those varieties. But we did, we did try, but it, it wasn't clear. Thank you. Uh, do we have any data on wet season conditions to prevent stress due to excess rainfall and crops with filled capacity water levels? No, not at the moment. Um, we are going to do with Nottingham some work where the plants will be stressed with lack of water. We, we haven't really looked at um, 
too much water, to be honest. Um, I, I think from what we know about or what was claimed about how the product works from other countries, I wouldn't really expect a big effect um, in those conditions. I think I think we're pretty confident that um, the best effects are seen around heat and possibly drought. But that, again, the, the connection to drought is a bit less clear. Thank you. Uh, there was a question in here around sort of single farm payment and environmental enhancements. I think that's probably a question best answered by uh, Belinda and Max tomorrow on the sustainability session. I know it's not a particular yeah. area of expertise for me. It's not my competence, I'm afraid. So, uh, <laughs> I think if you've got that question answered, then either you know, please join us tomorrow and you can ask that question to the experts in, in Syngenta. Yeah, no, I can't help them on that one. Um, I have a question that you might be able to help with. So tank mixes. Uh, we need to know that blight product efficacy is not affected. So I know you've done a bit of work. Could you give a view on mixing? Um, we, we've done we've done physical compatibility with a lot of different fungicides. Uh, I know at the beginning of last year, I drew up a very extensive list and we have tested um, physical compatibility. I think it would be just about impossible for us to test um, whether there was any um, impact on fun each individual fungicide's efficiency. I think during the year, uh, a lot of people obviously applied the product with, um, with their blight material. We, we've had no problems that I'm aware of, and I wouldn't expect any problems. But for us to actually test every single fungicide combination, that's just isn't possible. Okay, thank you for that. Um, that was the, the last question. Oh, hello, no one's just come in. Uh, so the question that's just come in is, is there any effect on blight control um, from less crop stress? <laughs> um, not that I'm aware of, and I'd be very, very wary of going down that route because we are um, approved as a material, as a biostimulant, um, and I think our clear effects are abiotic stresses i think we'd require a lot more work in the future to possibly unravel that certainly not at the moment something we would go anywhere near thank you uh another question has come in around a typical dose rate and cost per hectare so i'll probably take the cost piece so at the moment uh we are looking to hopefully commercialize this product and have it available for 2021 so michael's been working heavily on, on the trials and we're now working on the, the commercial terms of that. So what I would say is, you know, stay in contact with the distribution and your Syngenta area manager. So we are hopeful of having it available for 2021. Uh, the pricing is being worked on um, as we speak, really. So do you have a view on a kind of a, a typical dose rate, Michael? Well, I mean, the dose rate we have worked on is um, two litres per hectare for each individual dose. I think, um, I think one of the things that we're looking at this year, and I mentioned this is about reactive and proactive um, timing, is uh, we've done in the past timing according to growth stage, and we've seen a benefit from using up to three applications. Uh, in many cases, I think if you timed it perfectly, you could probably get away with a couple of applications in the season. But I think um, it's this correlation or um, co uh, try to more closely tie it into the heat stress bit which uh, we're continuing to work on a bit further but I think at the moment um, you know we've seen these benefits in the in the trials I presented today from three applications so that's a total dose of six litres applied at three different points in the season. Thank you very much um, so we have a question now it's coming around sort of virus in potatoes so in fact, there are various claims coming in um, from the states that virus in potatoes is as much down to crop stress as it is to aphicide usage. Have you any thoughts on this with Qantas? I, again, I think um, it's not something we've we've even tried here yet. So I, I would no, I, I can't really help you on that one. And again, I think we have to be very careful because uh, it's very clear within the uh, rules set by CRD that um, if you have a biostimulant product, it does not have direct um, crop protection uses. So I think at the moment, A, I haven't tested it, and B, from the point of view of where we are in trying to bring the product to market, we wouldn't, wouldn't go near that at the moment. Thank you. Uh, there's a question around trials, if they're likely on other crops in the future. So 
Again, yes, move. there is. My, my colleague, um, uh, Andy Cunningham, is taking a, a look at use in cereal crops and also, I believe, in sugar beet. So, yes, there are, I mean, they are kind of at the stage that we were in potatoes a couple of years ago. So uh, he's, um, I think, got a, a program this year to try and evaluate, particularly in um, cereals, wheat in, in particular, and some work in sugar beet. Thank you. But would you say that Qantas has a place for varieties that maybe are deemed to be more susceptible to the autumn area? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, thank you. I guess one to look at as we, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of less stress and the benefits from Qantas, could this potentially lead to more difficult desiccation given the loss of dicot? Well, I, I kind of hope that, um, you know, diquot's been gone for a while now. People have been thinking about their um, alternatives, whether that's flailing or, or using the other similar materials that you can for desiccation. I, I don't think it'll have a big impact. I really don't. Because, I mean, we're not seeing, um, as I mentioned when I went through the slide set, we're not seeing huge differences in the way that the, the foliage of the crop is behaving following treatment. If the differences are there, they're very, they're quite subtle. Um, and so I'm not thinking that, you know, you're going to end up having the crop growing on for days and days longer than it would have done had it not been treated. So I don't, I don't think it's going to have um, an impact on your desiccation program. Thank you. Uh, this is the final question. So yeah, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, now's probably your uh, last chance to submit by the Q&A function. So I know this is an area you've been looking at, Michael, because it's related to applications and uh, decision support tools. So uh, it's an element we're looking at as, as we move forward. Um, but the question is that it appears that Qantas will need to be applied before stress period um, if our decision support tools are not improved. Uh, therefore, stress period could occur many times during the season. Uh, so would you advise that Qantas is applied uh, as an insurance at this stage? Yeah, I think based on what we know at the moment, you know, we've applied it according to the growth stages that I've I set out in, in the talk, you know, um, onset of bulking two weeks after onset of bulking and uh, the canopy max stage. And in the moment, that's the best information that we have going forward after this year, um, when I'm, I'm working with my colleagues in the new farm um, technologies group and the application group, uh, we are, as I say, going to be looking at um, doing timing much more according to um, predictive heat stress and comparing that with doing it reactively after heat stress. Uh, and hopefully we will develop quite a bit more information and knowledge to see whether or not, you know, you, you can use um, predict weather predicting systems to give a more effective result than simply going by crop growth stage. But at the moment, the information that we have is around those crop growth stages. Thank you. Uh, we'll say we'll have, that was the final question. That was about to wrap up, but um, we have another question coming, so we'll, we'll answer that. So in the trials, uh, were there any major differences between irrigated and uh, unirrigated crops? Now, that's a good question. We did look at it and I specifically asked ADAS to see if they could do an analysis um, that showed a difference because I thought there might be. Um, but we weren't able to show that. And that's one of the reasons why we're kind of not exactly redoing it, but trying to do it in slightly more controlled conditions um, in some laboratory tests at um, University of Nottingham this year to see whether or not, if we look at it in a lot more detail, that we can see that. Because I'm sure you appreciate that irrigation is variable. It's variable within a field. It's variable between different farms because they have different setups. Um, and, and that may be why when we looked at the data, because of the general noise caused by uh, all these different conditions, we weren't able to pick up a clear kind of response. So maybe we will be able to if we have more control conditions than uh, we had in the, the farm, si farm scale trials in 2020. So at the moment, no, we can't, we can't categorically say that, you know, irrigated crops need it more than unirrigated crops because we don't have enough data. Thank you, Michael. Well, that does appear to be the final question. So, uh, yeah, thank you for your presentation today and for answering those questions. And thank you to everybody that joined. Uh, one, for joining us, and two, for the, the questions and engagement. It's always good to have that uh, engagement and feedback from you. So, 
Hope you enjoyed the event. Uh, as I said before, information on how to apply for the basis and, and register points will be sent in a follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, there'll also be a survey, so if you could please take the time to give us your feedback, always looking at ways we can, I guess, improve what we're delivering to you, making sure we're meeting your needs uh, and we're adding value to your crops and your, your growing. Um, and so just a final reminder as well, tomorrow, so tomorrow's session is on sustainability, so there is still uh, time to register for that event on the events page on the Syngenta website. So enjoy the rest of the day and we look forward to hopefully welcoming you back tomorrow. Thank you then. Bye-bye. All right.